So the key is preventing the pathogens as much as possible all the way through the fruit and vegetable chain by improving existing good agricultural practices and good manufacturing practices. It's, these are very, very popular in the United States around the world. Um, but right now, in, there's a, there are some recommendations that, need, that are lacking research-based uh, recommendations to support it. Uh, water, irrigation water is a good example. Um, irrigation water in the United States is now going to be, it, it's predicted to be regulated. This is not because of the government wishing it, but because the uh, California Leafy Greens Market Association, an industry group, is trying to force the, the government into implementing regulations for irrigation water. And they're suggesting that irrigation water be the equivalent to recreational water, which is the same as what you swim in, so very, very strict. And for farmers, it becomes very, very complicated and expensive to treat the water uh, to meet these proposed uh, guidelines for irrigation water. Also, if alternative effective decontamination methods that, make, that retain the quality and texture, nutrition, but also effective in reducing the pathogens are, is extremely important and is, is, a, is a large focus of the research in my research group. Specifically, we're looking at effective decontamination methods for high-risk produce. So on the second slide, where it showed all the different produce types, leafy greens was responsible for 37%. Within that chart, 10% of the foodborne illness outbreaks associated with produce was due to sprouts, mung bean sprouts and alfalfa sprouts, 10%. But in the North American diet, they represent less than 1% of the total consumption. So it's a very, very high risk commodity. We're also looking at research to identify high risk farming and post harvest practices, such as looking at waterborne human and plant pathogens. And I collaborate with a plant pathologist, and we're looking at whether the quality of water is the same for the risk of foodborne pathogens as it is for plant pathogens. And we've got very interesting information. The, this, this information is not existing in the United States or anywhere in the, in, in the world. What is the general irrigation water quality? What is the incidence of pathogens for E. coli, salmonella, um, just general E. coli. And can E. coli be used as an indicator of, of safety and quality for water for the fruit and vegetable producers? Irrigation practices and quality indicators. What, what is the difference uh, between the irrigation practices? Is there a difference in the, in the fruits and vegetables that are grown with overhead irrigation versus flood irrigation or drip irrigation? And can we use E. coli as an indicator, a proper indicator, for predicting the safety of irrigation water? One of the primary focuses is looking at one of these high-risk fruit and vegetable uh, commodities, sprouts. We have had many, many outbreaks, more than 30 outbreaks in the United States associated with, with fresh sprouts. Usually it's E. coli 157 or salmonella. And usually at the beginning, because the seeds that are used to, to make the alfalfa sprouts have to be tested, and they're below the detection limit. So usually less than, less than one per 100 grams of seeds. However, even though they show that there's no pathogens present during sprouting, only in 24 hours you have 10 of the six colony forming units per gram of seeds of both E. coli 0157 and salmonella. It's because as the seed starts to germinate, it releases the ideal substrates for the human pathogens to quickly grow. So in just 24 hours, over a million uh, pathogens per gram of, of sprouts. So it's ideal conditions. The problem specific with sprouts is in North America, they don't like them cooked. They want to use them with salad. 
So the same as in, in salads in, in Thailand, where you don't want your lettuce or your, your cucumbers cooked, you want it fresh. They want, in, in North America, they eat sprouts fresh. So they do any kind of, you can't cook them because it changes the texture and quality. Also, because sprouts have, are grown in a very high moisture, humidity environment, you have pathogens growing quickly. They're internalized right into the structure, all throughout the root, all the way up to the developing um, seed leaf area. So because they're internalized, it makes decontamination very, very difficult. Surface decontamination methods are ineffective, such as chlorine, you can wash them in 1,000 parts per million chlorine. It's ineffective. Right now, the regulation is that the seeds that are used to produce sprouts have to be washed in 20,000 parts per million, which is 2% solution of chlorine, for 20 minutes. And still, we've had outbreaks uh, due to treated seeds, both in the seeds and in the sprouts. Even parasitic acid is a new, uh, relatively new sanitizer that is being used to decontaminate produce, but it doesn't show any better effectiveness compared to chlorine. Rather than using high levels of chlorine, we looked at using very low temperatures for long periods of time to treat the seeds, so preventing the pathogens before sprouting. We used 55 degrees Celsius for 72 to 144 hours. We initially found it was very effective for mung bean sprouts. Um, both E. coli and salmonella, they died um, and did not resurge uh, even during sprouting. And it didn't affect the uh, seed germination. The seeds are very sensitive to temperature, so anything higher than 55 degrees Severe, dramatically reduced the germination rate, which was unacceptable for the sprout producers. When we tried it with alfalfa seeds, because they're smaller, larger surface area, uh, it showed a much lower germination rate. This is the student that is responsible for this research. We inoculated at low, medium, and high inoculation rates. We need to initially do high inoculation rates to make sure that we have a five log reduction but the low and medium inoculation rates represent more what would be naturally found on the contamination in, on the seeds. We inoculated alfalfa seeds with five strain cocktail of E. coli 157 and salmonella, and we engineered these, two, these strains to ex express green fluorescent protein because when we use antibiotic media for selecting the pathogens, it actually killed the, um, the injured cells, so it was an overestimation of the, of the log reduction we were achieving. We heat treated the alfalfa seeds for 55 degrees Celsius and sampled over the time course uh, uh, up until eight days, and we played it on TSA, looked for green colonies. We also used apicillin to see the number of injured cells versus healthy cells. We rehydrated the seeds after treatment for four hours, and then we sprouted them at 30 degrees Celsius for 72 hours, and we sampled the sprouts at 24, 48, and 72. This is to make sure that we weren't detecting pathogens in the seeds and that the pathogens were actually not growing during sprouting. So this is for high-level E. coli 157 inoculation. This is the heating time, zero, four, six, eight days. So this is the control, the inoculation level at 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9. After heating, you can see at day 6, it was below the detection level. And during sprouting, it also was not, the pathogens did not uh, regrow. You can see at 4 days, we got a 5 log reduction, which is usually regarded as the, the target uh, reduction. But we found that quickly, there was enough pathogens still surviving that quickly grew uh, during the sprouting period. For the low inoculation, which is more representative of seed contamination, you, this is the control in the yellow bars. After four days, we, we, it was below the detection limit, but the pathogen still um, researched and during the sprouting period and were surviving. But after six days at, at 55 degrees, uh, the seeds 
um, did not have pathogens detected, and they also did not grow during the scrubbing, which means that for this level, six days at 55 degrees is, is, is adequate for guaranteeing the safety of scrubs. We also did for salmonella. Salmonella is more heat resistant, and for the high level, we found that we had to go to eight days, but even after eight days, we had, um, the, even though it was below the detection limit, we had a very quick resurgence of salmonella growing. We found that extended periods past eight days, up to 10 days, were, were required to get the below the detection limit of salmonella and no growth uh, during the sprouting. So by treating the seeds this way, we found it to be more effective than chlorine, but also it guaranteed the safety of the sprouts after. For fresh cut, so these are prepared fruits and vegetables, the surface and internalized contamination uh, or internalization contamination issues are very important for produce. Once it's cut, it also allows for pathogen growth but, and increase in numbers, but it also for the internalization makes it very difficult. So in doing challenge studies, you have to do both spot and dip inoculated uh, for produce because it represents you just have contamination on the surface or internalization. Um, and as I said earlier, higher risk associated with fresh cut because it's, it's ready to eat and will be consumed fresh. The other issue is that it's a very de most of the produce is very delicate. It's very sensitive to decontamination methods. And if you use chlorine, you bleach the chlorophyll so it changes the color and the appearance of, of the produce, which is unacceptable. Or it causes tissue damage and it begins to wilt and it's unacceptable for consumers. What we're looking at right now is looking uh, using non-thermal processing on uh, both spot and dip inoculated pro uh, produce. We're using ultraviolet light and high pressure processing. With ultraviolet light, we were skeptical on the efficacy, but what we found was surprising. Um, this is for spot inoculation. This is time zero. So initially it's greater than 10 to the 5, but after we, could, we just about got a 5 log reduction with 1,360 millijoules of exposure, which is only about 2 seconds of, of UV exposure. Very high UV exposure, top and bottom, so you get good uh, exposure for all the surface. Worked very well. This is for spot inoculation, not for immersion. For dip inoculation, which represents internalization of the pathogens into the produce, you can see that, make note that the y-axis is, is much, much narrower now. So we only got about a one and a half to two log reduction, it's more like one and a half log reduction, even with 500 millijoules of exposure, and only two log reduction with 1,360 millijoules of exposure. So UV decontamination is effective for, for surface decontamination, but if you have infiltration of pathogens, it's not, not near as effective. As a control for what is typically used in the industry right now, this is chlorine, and this is for spot inoculation. So this is, uh, represents the easier of the two uh, for decontamination. Only a two log reduction um, for we, we tested 10, 50, 100, and 200 parts per million, which is very typical for the produce industry uh, to use um, in post-harvest operations. Only a two log reduction, even at the highest level of chlorine, and we would have to have a potable water rinse because regulation only permits 50 parts per million for cut produce. So it just shows you how ineffective the decontamination methods are that are available to for, for produce um, operations right now. Important, because decontamination methods are so limited, it's more, it's very, very important to focus on preventing it earlier on through good agricultural practices. All agricultural practices during um, production, all the way from how the seeds are handled to the harvesting and post-harvest uh, in the packing houses. 
such as water supply for irrigation, sprays, and harvest. How the manure is managed for the soils. Not even if the manure is, man is used in the farming operation, but if the neighbor farm has, has manure on his property or upstream in the water, if, they have, if there's exposure to animals and the, and the manure is possibly uh, contaminating the water, it becomes very important. Wildlife restriction, trying to prevent wild pigs, wild animals from coming into uh, the crop area is, is, in, is extremely important as well. And then one thing that farmers forget is the equipment that's used for other practices on the farm can actually be a vector for foodborne pathogens that get into the, into the crops. So if they use a tractor for animal operations and then they take it into, the, into their fields, they're now possibly introducing high levels of pathogens into the crops. Current good manufacturing practices in the produce industry, uh, the workers are not usually trained adequately. Um, proper hygiene has to be stressed for the workers. Providing bathrooms to close location. Now it is um, a, um, an industry guidance to you to have a bathroom within a half a kilometer of where the workers are. So rather than them having to walk three kilometers, you have to make them close and accessible so that they use them. And also that they have hand washing stations right at the bathroom. So after using the bathroom, they can wash uh, their hands with soap for the proper amount of time. Transportation vehicles. So these are the vehicles that, are, that pick up the produce and then take them to the markets or to the grocery stores. We have had outbreaks because they, they in one transportation vehicle, they bring raw meat or live chickens along with fresh strawberries or fresh produce and it's very easy for contamination. So the transportation vehicles have to be cleaned and sanitized just to prevent the potential cross-contamination for foodborne pathogens uh, onto produce. Focusing on prevention, some of the research we're doing is uh, related to the lack of irrigation water standards as I mentioned earlier. It is the, the recreational water standards are, are very strict and, and it's going to be very difficult for most farmers to achieve these. The surface internalization for produce comes from irrigation, whether it be usually overhead is more risky, sprays, and then also, depending on the produce, flumes are used not only to cool, but also a very gentle way to move the produce without damaging or bruising uh, the produce. And so the water that's used in these flumes has to be, the quality has to be of good sanitary quality. Then we're also looking at water quality and if there's a correlation between human and plant pathogens. Because the farmers are very interested in, in the, making sure that they don't have plant diseases and less interested in, in whether they have um, food safety issues associated with their water. So we're looking at if we can use plant pathogens as an indicator of food safety pathogens uh, for fruit and vegetable um, production that uses agricultural water. What we are doing it right now is we're looking at irrigation water that's used for, uh, for growing fruits and vegetables in New York. It's sampled for human and plant pathogens over the entire season from, start, from when it's planted to the time it's harvested. We're looking for E. coli 157, salmonella, and then Phytophthora is a very big problem in the United States. And so we're looking specifically for this. And then we're also sampling for generic E. coli to see if it's a better indicator of, of, that can be used for microbial quality. We're also, when we sample, we ask what type of irrigation method they're using. So overhead irrigation, or flood or drip irrigation or any irrigation. Also the water source because not only in New York we use streams, rivers, we also have ponds that we use or sometimes they use well water. 
In California, it's very different because most of the, of the produce that is grown is watered with well water, which is very safe because it's very deep. Uh, they're very deep wells, and there's very little potential for foodborne pathogens for entering. We sampled seven locations across New York State, all the way from west of uh, the very western part of New York, all the way down on Long Island. So it represents more than 500 miles uh, of distance. And we sampled milk um, every week over the course of the growing season from May through October. What we, what we found was generic E. coli was present in just about all the samples. The levels were variable and in some locations exceeded the limits by this California Leafy Greens Marketing Agreement. This is the industry uh, guidance that is, that is scaring all the fruit and vegetable growers because they want to have the irrigation water standards to be the same as recreational water standards. The and then acceptance criteria for pre-harvest water use for foliar applications um, is 100 less, it has to be less than 126 most probable number per 100 milliliter and this is a geometric mean of five samples and it has to be less than 235 most probable number per 100 ml for all single samples uh, that make up the five samples. So these are the current recommendations. What we found was already some of our samples would exceed um, the 235 most probable number as well as the 126 most probable number. So currently we would have, the farmers in New York State would have a very difficult time meeting uh, the Leafy Greens Market Association standards that are being proposed. All the sources of the water were negative for E. coli 0157 and we did have preliminary positives based on plating, but PCR and antibody uh, subsequent testing proved that they were not E. coli 157, but just regular E. coli. Five sampling sites out of the seven had preliminary positives for salmonella, and four of the five were confirmed. So salmonella was, was found in four of the five, four of the five farms uh, that tested positive. And the problem is, is that where this, where we think the source of the salmonella is, what is attracted to water? Birds. And we have a very large geese population in New York. So the geese use it as their home, and they also shed salmonella. So we had salmonella that, that was a chronic problem throughout the growing season, just due to the birds. From the plant pathogen side, all of the water sources, so all seven farms from the different pond, river, or river creek, um, all tested positive for Phytophthora. So it was actually an indication that the plant pathogen stress and incidence was very high. And two locations so show consistent presence. So we tested, we didn't find any Phytophthora until late in the season in August, so late summer, right about this time, and it remained all the way until harvest. So the Phytophthora levels were low at the beginning and then gradually increased, which represented a higher stress level for the plants. And by the end of the season, it was consistent levels and presence in all the farms that were actually sampled. So the key thing, prevention from from the farm, all the way, every step at the at harvest, in the packing house, even down to the consumer, is, is very, very important to try and improve the safety of fruits and vegetables. Right now, um, I received this uh, a grant that's specific just for enhancing the safety of fruits and vegetables. It's a very large grant. We have Four states, six universities, 16 researchers, more than 30 graduate students. Um, we also have industry that's supporting it. This is the National Restaurant Association. This represents more than 100,000 members. Um, we have the Berry Growers Association, so like raspberries, blackberries. 
and then the Groceries Grocers Manufacturers Association. This represents every grocery store in the United States. They're all uh, assisting with this grant, as well as processors and farmers. We're looking at the incidence of pathogen contamination in feces from animals, in dust, in water. What types of water are highest risk? What we, what we are going to achieve by the end of the four years is to identify the highest risk practices associated with growing fruits and vegetables, whether it be having animals close by, what type of irrigation water, this is all going to be identified. In addition, we have another $600,000 grant that is looking at developing the effective decontamination methods for fresh produce that retains nutrition as well as quality and texture. And this is with the uh, University of Delaware and Rutgers University, and this is for three years. So it's going to be a very busy four years. But it's because of uh, the national uh, research importance being placed on the safety of fruits and vegetables that we were allowed to get one of the, actually this was the only grant that was awarded last year. So we've, we've got a lot of uh, work to do to meet the expectations of our funding agency. And with that, I thank you, and good luck with the conference.